that was a pretty awesome trip. It was just like solid partnership, <clears throat> pretty, pretty heinous conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, but just being with like a really tough group that you just didn't even need to talk to. Yeah. Like I like talk to them. Just to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you just didn't need to communicate. You knew, yeah. you knew your, you knew each other and the dynamic and the thresholds and like somebody would pull more weight when somebody else is feeling like just crushed. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Mountain Tough Podcast. This is a top mental toughness podcast in the country. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks for listening week after week as we push the limits and learn from folks from a variety of backgrounds on mental toughness, mindset, resilience, adaptability, and backcountry performance. We don't run any ads on the Mountain Tough podcast. All we ask for a fee is to tell your friends, share these episodes, and please leave us a review in the app store. We love seeing those reviews. So take a minute and rate this show, this episode in the app store of your choice when you get a chance. It's been a busy couple of weeks in the lab. We just got done with the huge Tough Fest event on June 22nd here in Bozeman. It was an epic day, an epic couple days. The biggest thing that I saw was it was pretty phenomenal to watch as all the Mountain Tough community gathered and we packaged 42,500 meals for Montana kids through Mountain Ops's help and their Conquer event. It was pretty phenomenal seeing those packaged up through the Mountain Tough community and that helped Mountain Ops reach their goal of giving 5 million meals out to kids worldwide. So an epic day. Make sure you mark your calendars for that event next year. The recap video went out, so check that out on YouTube, and you will see everything we did that day from the Baldy hike, from the Conquer Hunger event, to the huge Mountain Tough team workout, to the speeches and film premieres in the evenings. You are not going to want to miss it next year. Now, diving into today's guest, today we have Sam Magro. Sam pushes the limits on rock, ice, and snow. He's been professionally guiding mountaineering since 2004, so his depth of experience in backcountry performance is deep, and he has a lot of first ascents on snow and ice. He's always looking for ways to learn, ways to improve, and he's traveled the world in in his pursuits, and he's even had his family with him living in some of these countries as he's chased a lot of these first ascents. You're not going to want to miss this amazing conversation with Sam, so stand by and we'll dive right in. Just wild time lately with the kids, and whatnot, but it's good. We're just recalibrating with yeah. like everybody every every month, every year. So yeah, yeah. I think it'd be fun to, one thing I would, did want to dig in on a little bit that I think would be really cool and interesting is like with guiding, mountain guiding, the different like mental toughness components you've seen of your clients that have shown up. So mm -hmm. like with my, like with my hunting experience, I've seen where like someone who's sometimes more out of shape than someone else is more mentally tough than that other person and can outperform. Mm -hmm. Or <clears throat> we've been on like goat and sheep hunts where we've seen people panic and freeze like on the mountain because of fear. Mm -hmm. And so just some of those components would be pretty fun to talk about too. Yeah. I'm just trying to think <laughs> of some examples. <clears throat> so from my years of guiding, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of mental toughness in, uh, but it's just like exposure to heights, you know, that's just like, yeah, totally sec. It's just a totally different thing. Yeah. It's almost it different than mental toughness. Yeah. It could be extremely mental tough and then just yeah. freeze up. <clears throat> yeah. I definitely had that happen on Granite Peak with a group actually. Someone freeze up. Yeah. Like I took them up Granite Peak and, and the Wind Rivers. And they were one of the fat. They were the fastest group that I've ever guided up there. Really, as a husband wife. And then we took them the next year. I was like, oh, we'll go do Granite Peak. Um, <clears throat> and they just as soon as we got into technical rock climbing, um, yeah, they just one of them just froze. 
huh. more or less. We were moving yeah. so slow that I realized it wasn't going to be realistic to go up and down. And that's probably just the fear of height, you think? Yeah, just exposure. Uh, snow terrain versus like rocky, steeper climbing, rock climbing terrain. Just fear of heights. Yeah. Because all, all, that's all it really was. Are most of your most of your clients nowadays are, are like over the last three or four years? Are they showing up pretty in shape? You know, <clears throat> for like technical rock climbing, I would say people there's a higher bar in in a lot of ways. Uh huh. Um, and then maybe for mountain climbing, sometimes there's a there's an increase. Guiding's blown up, you know, in the last ten years, like all the. All the literature I've looked at, it's just like taken off. Yeah. Doubled, tripled, whatnot. So it's just because of all the climbing gyms. Yeah. There's climbing gyms just popping up in every, I mean, in this town we have three. So every major city in the United States pretty much has a climbing gym. Which is leading to a lot of people craving these trips. Yeah, and so they want to climb real rock. And so then they come out with us. And so a lot of them are strong, um, but have no real climbing experience. Yeah. Like rock climbing experience as far as like technical climbing goes. And then as far as like mountain, I think a lot of people inherently will just, just try to jump into mountain climbing from that and they don't necessarily have that. Um, like they don't even know how to take a, a shit in the woods. Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. like real bait. Like they don't have that. <clears throat> or historically before it was like, I think a lot of people get in the mountains like they went hunting or hiking or fishing as a kid. And yeah. And so you, there's just, it's mixed. It's changing a little bit, I would say. But um, yeah, fitness though, if people are, yeah, technically for rock climbing, they're maybe getting more fit. <clears throat> yeah, even the training for climbing, even indoor climbing seems like it ramped up in the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the gyms are way busier and people can get on these like training programs. Yeah. Climbing was kind of anti, almost anti-training, I would say. For a long Previous, time. Yeah, and now it's more like, I mean, it's Olympic sport. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So there's like... Um, there's regimented, much more regimented, uh, training for climbing. What, what is your, like the demographic of your stereotypical client look like now? You know, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd say historically there's always just kind of lots of walk, like all walks of life. But I think inevitably if you're spending money to hire a guide, Obviously, you've met your basic needs, mm -hmm. you know, you got your kids in school and food on the table and you're taking a vacation somewhere. And then on your vacation, you're also hiring a guy. But we get we get a good mix, though. I yeah. would say, I mean, we've had like, you know, teachers and principals, local educators from here. Um, and it depends on which aspect of our guiding you're talking about, too. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot of like the active military training and then we've done a lot of the like you know mountains almost as therapy i guess for different all sorts of different groups yep um from like just there's a guy that's come out this summer with like father son a bunch of father son groups for example <clears throat> some of these things are subsidized some aren't and then we have like the tourist scene you know i'd say those are more like affluent folks generally in the no. tourist world and then uh the mountain like objective folks that hire us or that's more of a seems like a more of a mix of the demographics right. some people just get their mindset like i wanted to do this goal i want to get this and mountain. now i'm going to prioritize saving money to do this yeah versus like i'm going on vacation and i'm going to drop you know so many hundred dollars for a half day with my kids which is like oh, that's a lot maybe i'll just go on a hike with my kids instead yeah you know so that's Say the mountain objectives, you, you it's you get folks from all over. Yeah. Are you taking clients all over the world now? Uh, yes, kind of always have been. I guess. <clears throat> I mean, I started guiding in Peru, actually, or started guiding here, ice climbing, guiding here in highlight, and then the next year was in the Cordillera Blanca, which is like high altitude, glaciated peaks. Um, and then over in Europe, okay. in the countries that, you know, some countries it's easier to guide in than others. Mm -hmm. So certain countries in Europe and, uh, yeah, kind of all over. And then just we do custom trips, you know, yeah. for wherever folks are, are psyched to go on. And um, 
from ski objectives to mountain objectives to rock objectives. So, so <coughs> someone could call you with like a big trip they've had in mind for a couple of years, like some some big mountain, and regardless of where it's at in the world, you can help them make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say completely regardless because some countries have more um, legalities. Yeah. You know, like, for example, um, in Argentina, you have to work with, uh, you might have to work in Argentine or in Tanzania, for example, you have to work with some locals, Local. which I think is kind of a good model anyway. You're yeah. Like, you're contributing to the, that local economy, not just coming in and using their resources and leaving. Yeah. So I kind of prefer that. Um but yeah, pretty much you could set up. And then if I can't do the trip, like there was a guy that wanted to go on this like kind of a binge trip of climbing all these different peaks all over Europe and all these different countries, like a mountain every other day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just passed it off to somebody else because I couldn't. I had one year old. I had one year old twins. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you should hire somebody else. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, <clears throat> that's just, but now we have, there's just, there's a big crew of us guides. So if, you know, if I can't personally do it or we can't do it through MAG, uh -huh. then the, we're just all, it's pretty tight knit. Find somebody. So we just work together and a lot of folks are like, hey, this guy wants to do this. or And then other folks refer folks to us. Other guides will refer interested people to us. And what year did you start Montana Alpine Guides? <clears throat> well, Montana Alpine Guides, it's an old permit, actually. It started, the permit goes back to 1985, um, but it was like a... You know, it was like five days of guiding. What was it called the same thing? I think, I don't remember what it was called. It was Doug Mastrolio. Was the he guy. had it? Yeah. Huh. He started it because he was just working randomly at some ranch. And he wanted to take some folks climbing. So he asked the Forest Service and they said, sure, get a permit. <laughs> and then he didn't do anything. Or I shouldn't say he didn't do anything. He didn't do much with it. And then he sold it for, it was like a hobby. I would say it was a side gig hobby business slash permit. Yeah. It's really hard to get permits. Um, and then I worked for, uh, the, it became Montana Alpine Guides in 1995, but it was mostly just a summer operation. And then the winter, maybe five days of work for me. Yeah. And that was it. It wasn't yeah. really, again, it wasn't a job. I built houses. Yeah. It wasn't full time. Yeah. No, I'd just pick up some, and I'd guide in the Tetons in the summer. <clears throat> and then that owner, um, he, you know, he just got tired of it. And so then, um, I bought it from him, but again, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot in place. There was a summer operation, but it was pretty just, just like day trips with some tourists here and there, but maybe one or two guides keeping busy. I didn't even work here in the summer and then five days in the winter, maybe. Yeah. And then since then, yeah, I've definitely grown it. I think we have six, seven more different permits all across Wyoming, Montana, international operations, avalanche education, ski guiding. International expeditions, ice climbing has taken off, mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of like technical, more technical courses. Yeah, so it's definitely um, kind of blown up. Yeah, now well, it's full time, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's you full got time. Some employees and the... yeah, yeah. It went from the year I bought it in 2013, I guess. Again, you can't buy the permit, but I basically bought the permit. You have the permit. An yeah. old snowmobile <laughs> with some plastic boots. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. But it was, he just kind of passed it to me. He didn't want to do it. And he's like, you should run with this. Um, yeah, I think there was one guy, there was one guy helping me that first year, but very part-time. And now like this summer, you know, we'll have 10 folks rotating through between the rock For climbing, trips. the mountaineering, the backpacking. Um, the day rock climbing, yeah. And then the winter, it's a much busier in the winter, actually. But are you still doing some some of your own personal trips? Uh, like personal, like just me climbing. climbing on my own? Yeah. I would say <clears throat> out of necessity, um, my personal objectives have transitioned from long two-week to four-week like expeditions or um, you know, free climbing missions on El Capitan and Yosemite, for example, to uh, short half day missions <laughs> locally. Because <laughs> you can, I can just keep hyper focused, like, uh, like a more training. You know? Yeah, it's just where I'm at. I don't have the time with three young kids, so I and the business. I've, I've focused more on like the technical 
technical difficulties. Yeah. Versus like bigger objectives. And you have two year old so, twins and a five year old boy? Uh five year old girl. Five year old and then girl. A twin twin uh boy girl. Yeah. Man, two so year old your hands full. Yeah. That's busy. <laughs> yeah, so that's why it's just mostly sport climbing. Yeah. Is what it is. So it's just very is what my kind of focus is. So like a technical route or project climbing, mm -hmm. which is enough to scratch the itch, but it definitely every once in a while I'll get out and do like a, a bigger mountain climb or a multi-day trip. But, yeah. That way yeah. you're not out there for two, four weeks. Yeah. It's just not really, not right now, maybe in a, you know, in a little bit, but no, we're it's family kind of focus and <laughs> yeah, the business has been uh, growing quite a bit, but no, I've always kind <clears> of, <throat> I've noticed through guiding that the guides that always kept psyched were the ones that kept their own climbing alive mm -hmm. and the ones that came across as jaded or burnout were the ones that didn't, they were just guiding. Yeah. At least for, for me, that's a model I try to always keep because mm -hmm. I keep, I keep the psych, yeah. which is why my guiding, I kind of slowed down the guiding a little bit last because I had to have some room for, you know, personal and then running the business. So you can only do so much. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you're just guiding all the time, you're just going to burn yourself out on the whole passion that got you into the business. Yeah. For me, and some guys I do think are just, they just love that. And there's definitely guys that mostly just guide. Um, yeah. But our whole group, as they were very, the, the Monte Alpine guide group, or try to hire folks that are super passionate about their activity. They're, mm -hmm. they're climbing, they're skiing. I think first off, they're just more fun to be around because they're psyched. <laughs> they're super knowledgeable. Yeah. And so that's kind of who we've tried to keep on the, on the, on the roster. Um, yeah. And it makes a pretty good work environment, to be honest, I think. Oh yeah. So, it yeah. makes a great culture. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty good, we have a pretty good program right now. Did you go through some hard years, like transitioning from building houses, guiding on the side to making that leap into where mag was full time? Was there a couple of rough spots? No, <clears throat> I would say those years were like, I just had low expectations, you know, and I didn't need much. Yeah. I just was just, I, I historically I've always just worked in like intense intervals and saved a bunch and then lived off of that for a while mm -hmm. and, um, guiding lends itself to that, you know? So I would work with my dad, for example, like he had a metal business. So I would just crank out a small family metal business, but, um, you know, I just crank out for like three months and then. Yeah, do something else. So I have always had that kind of pattern. So as far as like, you know, I had a, um, I had a photography business, the my own small guiding thing on the side, San Margo LLC. When I worked for other companies, I worked for other guide companies, and then I'd um, frame houses or pick up finished carpentry, stone masonry. I've kind of dabbled between those three. Yeah, and mostly framing would probably be the. the I mean, it was just like pre-2008, so that was like really easy to get a framing job. In Bozeman. Yeah, and so I could just, I could always pick up work, and then guiding I would take whenever it came in. Um, and then MAG, when I took over MAG, it was just very manageable. It was just, it was basically like self-employment. Mm -hmm. So it was like easy to deal with. It was just fun, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. So it wasn't like a, I wouldn't, and I didn't have any, um, I didn't have a mortgage and, I would barely have rent because I just live in a place and then move out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so there wasn't like, I didn't feel overly stressed. I just drive whatever old car would get me from place to place. So I didn't really, I'd spend my money on experiences, climbing trips. Yeah. So there wasn't like that added stress. So I was able to just to kind of roll with it. And it, it naturally became the thing that provided more of an income. I'd say the last couple <laughs> of years, I'd say the last couple of years have been the more of like, as you've grown. Oh man, that's been the hard part Yeah, for me. That's been way harder. Um, just managing, you know, and, and creating systems and procedures so that, you know, everybody can follow stuff like growth is hard. Yeah. 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 
That's uh, yeah. I mean, this your gym seems like you guys have obviously grown. Yeah, growth has been hard for me because it it's awesome. Of course, that's what you want to happen, but it it does pull you. I think as the founder away from a lot of the stuff that got you into the business. Mm-hmm. So you go from like for me, I went from training a lot, never being close to a computer to now spending more time on the computer, more systems, more financials, Yeah, which is really a struggle for me as well. Yeah. No, I think that's a recurring theme of, yeah, that uh, seems uh, common maybe. I yeah. don't know. I haven't like, talked to too many other small business owners, but... I think it's a natural kind of pathway Mm -hmm. because you have the experience uh, and so you kind of need to be setting up those systems. But there's, I think, just finding some balance in there somewhere. Yeah, that's that's the crux. That's what I'm talking to my wife about it. Yeah, I'm like, man, this is... Lately, it's been, mm, I would say, much more challenging. But I think that's also because it's paired with twin two-year-olds so I can't <laughs> yeah. blame the business I can't be like oh this business is working Remember, I'm like well actually I'm just getting worked over in general so it's not like <laughs> it's not like I can say this is you know and <clears throat> it's true that it's my own making it's it's mm-hmm. my business so I can make it what I want it to be without burning or putting anyone out of course yeah. like I don't want to burn out any uh, co-workers yeah you know um so that's that's actually been one of my biggest things is just always try to foster a positive work environment mm-hmm. for others but also for us yeah selfishly because if people are in a bad mood then you're directly interacting with them you're like well this is no fun <laughs> for anyone yeah so we're always trying to um make it a positive work environment this last year was actually really really positive everybody said it was like one of most, the best years yet that's awesome which was um pretty cool and that's i owe it a lot to the um some lead guides that stepped in to help out a lot um we have a really talented crew so it mm-hmm. helps to hire the right people and so yeah we're getting there i guess <laughs> it's still but then you know right now we're, we're pumping the brakes we're just like keep it slow down a little bit keep it right where it is and um just kind of improve on the existing systems mm-hmm. and maybe focus on programs that we want to do more and some of the other ones that we don't enjoy or um, maybe do those or don't do them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of focus your time, which is nice because before that was never an option. It's like we took every single bit of work we could get, you know? Yeah. Now so, you can choose a little more. Yeah. I think for big picture wise, just kind of where you want to direct you know, like our avalanche education programs are growing a lot. And that's a pretty, that's all, that, that demographic's all local. That's like 95% like Gallatin Valley. Mm-hmm. People that want to learn about avalanche education, uh, skiers, snowmobilers, um, snowboarders, ice climbers. We actually just started doing a ice climber specific <clears throat> avalanche education course. So, yeah, that's big time around here now. Just uh, yeah. very busy. Yeah. No, it's a necessary knowledge, I guess. But what what can you tell me more about living in Spain and kind of how that went for you this year, kind of testing it out, and how'd you guys decide on that that location? Um, I, I lived in Spain like two thousand two, two thousand three, and I've always said I'd like to move back for some period of time. Um, and then before we even had kids, we said we wanted to move somewhere like Spain, mm-hmm. specifically, actually, <laughs> uh, to teach our kids Spanish. Yeah. And people live really well over there. Um, I mean, I love this country. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I absolutely yeah. love the U.S., especially Montana. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm always envious of their social fabric and communities and families. Their families are super tight. And they're really supportive of communities, like uh, people with kids. You know, you get like the, they like the the seas part. If you have young kids, they like it's just usher you into places, and <laughs> it's just you know, I just we just like it, and the climate's outstanding. But um, yeah, so we that was always kind of on the 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 
a dream kind of thing. You know? Yeah. We're like we're pretty stubborn. So we're like, we're going to make this happen. You got to try it. And so this, and as I mentioned to you earlier, um, because of COVID and then right into the newborns, I found myself not able to guide because I couldn't be out more than when the newborn twins were young. Babies. I was like, <laughs> it was insane. You know? I couldn't leave. I couldn't be gone more than three hours. I could have sandbagged my wife. It was just like, yeah, it was just insane. So I was like, all right, I'm just not guiding this summer. It was just too much. So I just ran the office and then it was COVID Roger right into the COVID. And then, uh, or right around now, I can't. And, um, so we weren't meeting up with anybody, anyone, anyone anyway. And so we were running the guide service remotely, which was never the intent or the plan. Mm -hmm. Like I like guiding. Yeah. That was, I, I'm getting back now. I'm getting back to where I'm guiding again more, mm -hmm. which is really quite wonderful. And so opposed to just running the business. So we just realized we're like, geez, we could do this anywhere, anywhere. And then just dealing with babies and, you know, two feet of snow is kind of epic. Um, it's like, it's like waiting, it's like waiting upstream. I mean, we just thought about, we're like, this is like, it doesn't have to be this hard. And then, uh, yeah. So, and, and Spain's quite a bit cheaper. Yeah. I mean, everything's cheaper in this town. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's to know it, it's, it's just, you can live really cheap and really well over there. Yeah. Um, and so we started looking into it and we're like, let's just do this. So we went to this little town, Chulia, 300 people is the size of the town. Wow. And it's at the foot of all this spectacular climbing and so we spent um a month there and so you could just walk to the crags and we could run our roles my wife and i pretty much run uh the higher admin roles of mag yeah. together and so we could swap off within that kid care and climbing it's like the same thing we were doing at home yeah but it's nice and we could just put them outside and you know there's like olive trees down the road <laughs> just like walk through the in the dirt instead of the snow which for us was uh just made our life a little easier yeah so that was uh i mean it was still hard i wouldn't be like how was it it was so awesome like i was i would just say it was like a, a proper adventure i try i don't even use that word very often but it was kind of uh had all the ups and downs and normal Oh, everyday parent. life yeah. you know it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't like pure bliss I would, <laughs> it was like there was times where we're like why do we do this because we had no kid care yeah and we were just the family for two months which we found two babysitters i think at, in different towns so do that you, you know that was a lot do you uh, find it like is healthier over there like quality of life food like community do you feel like it's a little bit healthier just in your lifestyle um you know there's food wise you, you can there, you know it's mediterranean so you can they grow everything so there's tons of produce depends where you are like when we were, we were there in uh, chilea like they're, co they're pretty close to the coast so there's tons of seafood nearby but you know they there's a lot of ham like you walk <laughs> into every bar and there's a there's a pig leg hanging you know, it's the jamón serrano. Um, and you, it's just like you end up eating tons of like really good. It's like prosciutto. Oh, yeah. But it's super cheap. You just get it on a piece of bread or whatever. Um, but, yeah, it is really easy to uh, eat healthy. If that's your, your focus. Um, just because there's a lot of, you know, fresh produce. Yeah. But it's a, I think the way people live, there's like a, I mean, the economy pays for it a little bit. Their mm -hmm. economy is like not nearly as strong as ours, for example. Because, and I, I think some aspects of it would be frustrating when you're in the work world. I think as Americans, we're just so used to things just being like pretty tight. Yeah. Just busy. People, yeah, you show up on time. You're like, we're there. It's pretty loose. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like people are late all the time. It's like, <laughs> you just kind of, but everyone's just like, whatever. You just it's just a different Slower view you're pace. living they're just like living for the moment they, they're they better at living in the present and in the moment is my um take it's just like the the culture yeah lends itself to that like there's not as much of a rush people walk like they don't need to but they're just like walk like to all the different places they're just because that's just kind of the they're the not culture. a hurry yeah. yeah there's just like and i find myself like you know i'm not I'm not a Spaniard. I'm definitely, you know, I, sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, I need to move a little. Like I'm pretty, I'm pretty high energy yeah. person, you know? So, but I just like the, uh, 
I like that feeling. I remember talking to this lady. She is from Azerbaijan, which is like, you know, old Soviet bloc country. And um, she was just saying how she, like a lot of people like that. There was like a lot of different folks from all over the world there. Like even mm-hmm. other Europeans, like, you know, Frenchies and British folks. And they're just the Spaniards and the Southern Italy, I think, too. They just kind of have this. Uh, just relaxed. Yeah, just a little more relaxed. It's just for whatever reason, that's the. The culture. I, I particularly like, like, we were in this one town, Bidareta. It was up in the north. <clears throat> the people there were, it was kind of almost unbelievable because we were just staying in this little uh, Airbnb in this town for 10 days at this guy's house, and um, we got super sick, like the sickest I've ever been other than uh, I got salmonella once in Peru, but <clears throat> like 100 almost 104 temp ended up getting pneumonia it was oh, it was we, and my wife and I are both sick and we had three sick kids oh. like really sick not just like <laughs> bad sick yeah and yeah. just trying to take care of the kids and when you could barely you didn't even want to move yeah so that was that was pretty desperate but um these locals we didn't even know were just like bringing us food yeah. Like, not like we we're dying and couldn't eat or get our own food. Well, it's close. <laughs> but, like, I, I couldn't, I didn't want to drive. But they were just, um, it was amazing how much, like, support they had. Like, my wife got better before, before I did. She's walking around with the kids, but, like, the locals would always just kind of check like, on you. Yeah. And they're like bringing gifts to the kids. And, like, I don't know, maybe it'd be the, sm- the same if you were sick in small town America and you're some foreigners. So I yeah. Think you Community know. seems to be bigger in some international spots, though, I think, than America sometimes. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean, and part of that, we're, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm a limited experience, you know, but yeah. this, this this town is growing so fast. It's kind of, um, in some ways, there's like a really good community here. I've been here for 23 years. My wife's from here, so we've got like a pretty good community, but. It's just bigger, and sometimes we're like, where it's just yeah, know, it's changing. You know, it's a fast so, change. And so, did you guys feel like you were kind of able to prove that you can you can work remotely? Yeah, yeah, and then also I could. I've guided in Spain in the past, and I've guided in Tanzania, and um, there's a lot of opportunity for guiding over there. Mm-hmm. And Mag being what it is, and you know, we've got a lot of like strong clients who have dedicated to climbing, whether it's mountains or skiing um, or just technical rock climbing. And so just I'm pretty confident if we just launched, uh, you know, international. Spain, yeah, international, which we have done, but it's always been custom. And just somebody's like, hey, I want to go do this 10 day. You know, I, I guided a 10 day sport climbing trip in Spain <clears throat> where we did a bunch of multi pitch, you know, bigger rock objectives and small cragging objectives. Um, but yeah, we can open a new chapter to guide over there, but also still do the higher admin roles and do the remote work. Yeah. And then it's just, you know, it just requires having the right folks in place here and paying them what they deserve. And that's what we did this year as a, a test run and it worked. That's sweet. And so, Yeah. We, the more it was like a pipe dream, and the more we look at it, we'd actually save money by moving to Spain, <laughs> <laughs> like quite a bit, actually, yeah. like <clears throat> a substantial the cost. Yeah. Well, kid care, you know, you don't it doesn't really kick in for free until kindergarten in the states, so that's that's free over there, starting at two, and then the health care would be, um, I think we're, you know we're, we'd save quite a bit there. So it's like we started looking at all the numbers, we're like. <laughs> And just, I think a lot of guides would be psyched on too, because if we started opening a program up there, then yeah. we would eventually, you know, some guides might come over and help with some of those trips and Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. That's in Tanzania, That's right? in Tanzania, yeah. which I've guided in the past. And that would be a pretty quick, for me, in Spain, I'd be in the same time zone. Yeah, I'd just fly down. I literally, I think I would just go, um, I'd have to probably go to Amsterdam, and, and then it's just a straight flight down to... Uh, Tanzania, Dang. Amsterdam. So it'd be like a pretty easy program to run. Yeah. So I don't know. We got a lot we're trying to <clears throat> figure out. Um, we're, we're applying for visas right now. Currently, mm-hmm. FBI background checks. <laughs> <laughs> got all that going. Fingers crossed. <laughs> like, what's on there? <laughs> no, no, I think we're good. Um, so yeah, that's um, 
like I said, we're kind of stubborn. It's just like, it's almost like this in some ways, this is like, uh, like a, something we want to do. And it's like a, taking the place of some of these mountain goals we want to do. Like yeah. the idea of traveling around for two months with small kids in Spain is, I think, daunting and um, uh, challenging. But it was no more challenging than life here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Say. It really was. It was a little easier just because of the lack of um, just letting them out. So they, they had autonomy and they're happier. Mm -hmm. They can roam a little bit. Yeah, just because yeah. of the, 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 the winter aspect. I love winter. But yeah. with small kids, I, I wouldn't say I love it that much. I think once they hit three or four, it'll be different. I can, you know. Yeah. So that's the... Bozeman winners with small kids is pretty rough. Yeah, and it's like, we've always wanted to do this anyway. Yeah. So. Um, so like the clients that are booking like, like a corporate executive that's booking a Kilimanjaro climb, do you think a lot of that is just like them looking for some sort of adventure in their life, something different? Yeah, I think so. What I've seen, um, and it's not always just like corporate executives, the guys we took over there were like young, but they did like really well. They were like Canadian guys that did, mm. came up with some website they made. Uh, I won't go into it in too detail. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think a lot of people, basically most of a lot of the climbing guides, 18 years old to let's just say 30, dedicated at a high level to climbing, skiing, mountaineering and so either you have a higher risk tolerance and so you can learn the skills and take risks you might not take later yeah so you learn this stuff really quickly because of that and then there's a lot of other folks a lot of our clients that we see um those years they dedicated and you know, they went to college or went to the military whatever it is they, they spent 12 let's just say 12 years of like focused on work or, certain path yeah and then they're like damn i want to do this but they don't have the skill sets and it is harder i think to get those skills just because generally people's risk tolerance is less because mm -hmm. you've gotten somewhat wiser yeah <laughs> you know, you're like that i could i mean yeah. i look back at what i've done or you know just you're like that was higher most of us you're like, oh, i took more risk when i was 20. oh i noticed that so, for sure yeah right you're yeah. just like you just don't think about the same you don't I think you see more tragedy and you're like, holy, you know. Especially okay. after kids too, I think. Yeah. No, you, yeah, definitely, right? Mm -hmm. After kids, I think my risk tolerance is, yeah, because it's not just you anymore. But when you're younger, you're not even really even thinking about it being high risk. You're just doing it. Yeah. And then when you're older and you look back on it, you're like, man, that was dumb or man, that was close. Yeah. Yeah. But you learned and you lived. Yeah. And some people don't which is the harsh side of it. But yeah, I, that's what I, I think a lot of folks that don't do that, that's where they benefit from hiring the higher guides like mm -hmm. us. And they're like, oh, I want to do these. I want to do something different in my life now. And then they'll, um, then they have hire a guide to like get up to speed. Like, okay, I want to learn how, I want to get these skill sets now. Or like, I just want to go climb this mountain. Yeah. It's like something It's in my backyard or, you know, whatever. It's just something I want to do. I want to, a lot of people like say I want to climb the highest points in all the countries. You know, and Kilimanjaro is like one of the. It is the easiest, I would say, for Africa. Yeah, yeah, for any highest. Country. Yeah. So, do you see some of these big trips being pretty life changing for people like that? Yeah, because I mean, if some people have never left the U.S., so I think just going to like, you know, like we've done the expeditions to Peru. So like just going to Peru or just going to Tanzania, just strictly from the cultural perspective, just like seeing other people live and getting to know people from a totally different nation is pretty uh, impactful. Mm -hmm. um, and then throwing a mountain in there, it's a pretty nice uh, challenge, I'd say, for that reason. That's why I think the international trips are pretty, pretty cool for that element. Mm -hmm. Just um, the travel, the culture, the food. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, well, it's just, if you haven't, it's, it can be slightly uncomfortable. It's not your norm. You know, you don't speak the language. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a little bit, <laughs> you're like, ah. so you're out of your comfort zone and then you get thrown on a mountain. If you're hiring a guide, you're out of your comfort zone. So you're pushing that again. 
<clears throat> you know, whatever mountain that might be. Um, as I think it's pretty rewarding um, mm. for folks. I mean, just climbing mountains pretty rewarding no matter what. I think even just a small walk up. But How'd yeah. you get into all this? Were you, did you grow up climbing? I grew up in Ohio, Southern Ohio. And uh, I think I always, I always, I just remember as a kid just like liking uh, like moments of discomfort, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> I'm like, not like I was like cutting myself or anything <laughs> bizarre. But I, I just remember just being like bringing wood in to the, for the um, wood stove, you know, and it's snowing or just like carrying a bigger arm load. Yeah. Just little things I just remember liking that I had to. And there'd be times where I didn't want to do it and I was pissed. I had you know, certain jobs or whatever, but I remember always liking that. And so it just, <clears throat> and we spent a lot of time running around in the woods, hiking around. Um, and then eventually started riding bikes through the woods and uh, a lot of just tree climbing, mm. rope swings, just kind of doing monkey business. <laughs> um, yeah, and then eventually started climbing in Kentucky, Red River Gorge. It was two hours from where I grew up. Okay. And that's uh, pretty famous among climbers, rock climbers. It's like international destination, which I had no really? idea. Really? Yeah, yeah, people from coast. all over the world. People from all the world come to Kentucky. People are like, really? Is rock climbing in Kentucky? Yeah, it's like, it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's all uh, overhanging sandstone pocket climbing. And so that's where I started technical climbing. But when we first went there, it was just like scrappy, you know, just scraping up some sketchy cliff grabbing onto branches just you know kind of just, <laughs> just doing to stupid figure it out yeah doing stupid stuff and then thinking maybe we should you know take the next step and get a, a rope um <laughs> we weren't it wasn't really climbing it was like scrambling you know so you didn't really need a rope but if you did fall you'd probably get would have gotten messed up so that's kind of where i that's where i started um how'd you yeah. wind up in montana yeah so we did a road trip when I was like in fourth grade all across the West from Ohio. And I remember stopping at the KOA and at Devil's Tower. Uh -huh. And my brother and I were like riding bikes around and we stopped at these, these guys' camp. There's um, two campsites I remember stopping at. One was these Swiss guys with these Enduro dirt bikes that they had started in Florida <laughs> and went all the way to Wyoming. We had dirt bikes. Yeah. So we were pretty psyched to talk to them. <laughs> We just would rip around on dirt bikes as kids too. But um just that was inspiring. The fact that they were just like up and going the other side of the world. And we're like, what? And then we went and saw some climbers and we're like, you know, it was like the classic Devil's Tower. If you're climbing, you go to Devil's Tower, all the tourists are like, Did you climb that? So we were those tourists, you know, we were kids, yeah. <laughs> but they were, we were kids, so they were excited to tell us all about it. And so that I think that was like super impactful for both of us. Seeing but, that. Yeah, it's like a memory that sticks out. And then just being in the West, um, just seeing big country, like, mm. like we just always wanted to, it drew us in. We were, a seed was planted. Um, and so my brother moved out here first in 97. And then I came out to visit him in 2000. I actually didn't intend on staying. I thought I was just passing through to go to the somewhere on the West Coast or something. Check that out. I was just checking places out. Yeah. And I just stayed on his couch for three months. But my cousin lived there too. And so I had a couple of milk crates stacked up with that was my little closet. But um yeah. So I stayed and actually started to start ice climbing that winter. Wow. And um that that set the skill. That was actually a pretty impactful year. I started ice climbing here and then worked with my cousin who had a tree business. And then that February I got a flight down to Chile, South America. And spent four and a half months um, combo of buses and hitchhiking around Chile, Argentina, Peru. Peru, is, you don't really hitchhike, but you take buses. Um, and climbed, ended up climbing. That's where I got into big mountain climbing. Okay. So I took the ice climbing skills I gained here in Bozeman and went and climbed some, you know, 20,000 foot peaks in Peru. Jeez. So I learned the technical, technical climbing there and then just... Applied it to bigger mounts where it's less technical, but more, um, you know, just the complexities of bigger mountains, crevasses and yeah. av avalanches and that kind of business. But Yeah, and a highlight here <clears throat> is some, like, world-famous ice climbing, isn't it, in yeah. Bozeman? Yeah, it is. I would say it's the best ice climbing in the U.S. Maybe I'm biased. Between here and Cody. 
Yeah. The whole greater Yellowstone ecosystem is what I would say is the best in the U.S. But Highlight in particular is like, it's just super convenient. Um, Cody's amazing for like multi-pitch ice where we guide down there too and, and mm-hmm. here. But Highlight, I mean, you can drive up there because of the road plowing and you walk 10 minutes and you're at this ice cliff. So it's just so convenient. So accessible. Yeah, it's just super yeah. accessible. So you can just go up there and climb for like, literally you could go up there and climb for two hours. You could do a three-hour round trip. Back to work. Bozeman. Back yeah. to the house. Yeah, back to work, dawn patrol, or you just go at like 5 a.m. and you're back at, you know, whatever, 8 yeah, or 9, depending on how long you want to climb. But it's like, whatever, 45-minute drive up there. So it's got that, but it's also got some big multi-pitch objectives, and you can get deep in the canyon. Um, you know, there's avalanche terrain. There's good skiing. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's known <laughs> among ice climbers all over the U.S. It's like a destination, and <clears throat> the way it sits and the aspects, it's the most reliable ice climbing venue. And more and more, it seems like everything in Colorado is, like, melting out or doesn't form till late, later. Um, highlight just consistently forms, like, in December. Just like every, seems like every year by December 1st. And then it lasts all the way till April and they, well, they close the road. Yeah. Otherwise we'd keep climbing. Um, so it's a pretty unique venue. Um, yeah, there's not that many places where they plow that's not like a yeah. mount, mountain pass or a ski resort. Yeah. It's unique for that. Um, Gets you a lot of experience. Yeah. So it's like. There's a lot of climbers here that, you know, you get a season highlight and they immediately go to Alaska. Young kids, you know, because mm-hmm. they don't, <laughs> just kind of like, I'm just going to charge the next. Yeah, so it's a good venue. It's a nice one to have right here in the backyard. But then there's tons of, you know, exploration to be had between here and, and Cody. Mm-hmm. Um, new areas <clears throat> that are not uh, on the radar, but highlights get such a high concentration of, of climbing. What do you think's the craziest or or sketchiest or scariest or most memorable trip or climb you've ever been on most memorable um probably climbing Cerro Torre down in Patagonia with two really good friends um Aaron Wilson and Kyler Palliser Kyler just passed away actually he just died of cancer like uh five months ago he's like one of my best friends but um, that was a pretty awesome trip. It was just like solid partnership, <clears throat> pretty pretty heinous conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, but just being with like a really tough group that you just didn't even need to talk to. Yeah, like I like talking. I was just have someone to talk to. You about. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you just didn't need to communicate. You knew, yeah. you knew your you knew each other and the dynamic and the thresholds and like somebody would pull more weight when somebody else was feeling like just crushed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that was just like, like a five day effort to climb that, but you know, some really big days, like pretty heinous uh, conditions getting there and day one was like 19 hours or or no, 16 hour day one, shorter day two. Anyway, it's just like, it's kind of the, that's like a childhood dream mountain for a lot of climbers. Have you ever seen a picture of it? Saratoria, it's just like this, ice capped needle Jeez. granite needle it's just like um it's a pretty inspiring thing yeah to want to get on top of for yeah. any, anybody who you climb or even if you're not a climber like geez look at that that is wild um and then to have you know gotten to the point where we had the the skill sets to go up it um yeah and then it was it was pretty scary coming down because it warmed up really quickly and things were like we we're cutting it a little close, I would say. So it was a little bit nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. But is that an ice climb? Or it's an ice combination? climb. Yeah, it was like, there's some mixed climbing pitches the year we did it. Um, some years it's all ice, but or there's the access pitches are on rock, um, which we got into some harder, harder pitches, just getting up to the main, the main route. But the mm-hmm. Ragni route, the one we did, the Ragni is pretty much an ice climb all the way, all the way to the top. And the last pitch is this rhyme ice. Hmm. notorious um kind of unconsolidated snowy ice vertical snowy ice so it's a little bit um intimidating yeah 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 <laughs> it's intimidating <laughs> and then you're up there and you're looking over the polar ice cap and it's a it's a very exposed place and you just the winds 
can be insane. Like they'll just knock you on your feet if you're down at the flat ground. So yeah, it's a place you don't, you want to get there and then you kind of just want to get the hell off yeah, of it. Just, <laughs> yeah, it's just a memorable trip. And part of the reason that was such a good memory is just the the, the crew. The lift. team. Yeah. Yeah. Like having done that. And Kyler and I, we did a lot of, um, we did some first ascents up in Highlight that were one of the hardest routes that I've done up there. It was a four pitch route we did together. Hmm. Um, and a bunch of other first ascents we've, we've kind of done in the area. Yeah. So we've done a lot of cool climbs together. and So you guys yeah. knew each other well or how you operate. Yeah. Yeah, good, good buddy. But uh, that was a pretty memorable trip. And there's a, I mean, there's a, a handful. Another, yeah, another route we did up in um, different friend of mine. He also passed away. Jesus, um, Ryan Johns. He died in Avalanche. But that was another route we did up in um, Southeast Alaska. Hmm. That was like a, it was a new route. It had never been done before. So that was pretty memorable to kind of just being going into um, uncharted terrain. Yeah. Doing something no one's done. Yeah, it's like figuring it out. It's kind of fun problem solving, and um, and that Southeast Alaska is kind of a, a pretty pretty cool environment. Mm -hmm. So, you still have some big climbs kind of left on your bucket list. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've always wanted to go to Pakistan and climb like Trango Tower or Nameless Tower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it's like those are big expeditions, you know. Just That's getting a lot in there. Of, a lot of time. Um, I don't think that would be too cool right now to leave my <laughs> wife and kids. And then just risk tolerance, you know. I don't – I've got some friends, other – lost a lot of friends, actually. Um, another friend died climbing, but it's just – yeah. I yeah. don't really want to – Finding those risk levels. Yeah. yeah. And so I think more for me, my focus is like big rocks without snow. <laughs> Cause snow and ice is just so many unknowns. I mean, rock climbing can be plenty dangerous, but um, yeah, I think it depends on the mountain. There's you can climb perfectly safe big snowy mountains, mm -hmm. but some of the stuff that I'm more drawn to, I guess, the more vertical, technical ice and snow mix can be. Mostly, it's a time thing, and then, yeah, I'd say mostly the time. But there's, yeah, my current focus just kind of like technical rock climbs in the immediate proximity yeah but yeah i know i definitely have a a lot of roots on the back of my mind you know different time and place in life that might have things line up to to go there and your wife's a climber too she is yep nice which is taking some adjustments because so for years when we started dating and then got married, there was quite a few years where it was just like, I didn't even bother calling anybody else, you know, just for rock climbing. She's, mm -hmm. she'll, she's a strong climber. Um, but I would just for like cragging, like day trips, we would just always be climbing together or weekend or like month long road trips. And then for certain harder objectives, I would link up and she's super supportive. I mean, I went and climbed El Cap free climbing mission when our first kid was four months old. Oh man. She told me, you know, she's like, go, you should, you should go do this. <laughs> it was actually good timing, I think, because I couldn't do much when Ileana was four months. And yeah. She was, um, you know, and Ily wouldn't notice I was gone. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like a good time to go do that. And it was, yeah, she was super supportive of it. A little different when the twins came. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> you're not going to. <clears throat> I mean, she didn't have to tell me I wasn't asking to do <laughs> road trips. But yeah, we climb. We've climbed a lot together historically, um, but we have not in the last couple of years. We just yeah. either one of us or the. I mean, you know, it's With like kid duty. Yeah, you're just tag teaming. <laughs> yeah, it's just like. I mean, there's days where we get her mom. Her whole, her whole family's here, um, so her mom will watch kids sometimes and we get a little window but go climb yeah but it's just kind of we're starting to get to where we have more time to do that right just this last month we're starting to get to climb together a little more how much time do you typically spend or do you do any at all like indoor rock climbing i'd say sadly i do more indoor uh Gym training, climbing. Mm -hmm. I say sadly because it just like doesn't really satiate the soul. Sometimes I feel like a a little gerbil, <laughs> you know, running around in a wheel. Yeah, but it 
you know, I don't know the brain chemistry, but I'm pretty sure I'm releasing some endorphins that keep me balanced. Yeah. I know, I know I am. Um, and so for that reason, it's actually really nice. Just like this workout I did with you guys today, you know, it's just like, I do like that, the gym workouts and training for that very reason. Yeah. Because I don't have the time to go out in the mountains for 12 hour days for three days a week. Yeah. So I can just go into the gym and plus climbing is one of those sports that if you don't stay on top of it, you feel it like you get rusty fast. Yeah. I feel like we're skiing. I can, I can just go schlog in the mountains for you know, 12 hour a day and just trudge along and do it. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's not comfortable, but climbing, if you haven't been climbing, um, yeah, you just get really weak. Your forearms, your finger strength, you just, yeah. so you're just, at, you get, it's, and that can be kind of like a little frustrating. Yeah. So the gym, you can just, I've been able to maintain, I've actually gotten stronger since kids. I'm climbing technically stronger than I ever have. So Do you just think focus on the gym. Yeah, just focus training. Yeah. Yeah, I've just been training on, um, I mean, not like what we were doing, you know? I'm like, <laughs> I felt like that. I was like, oh, this is a new, it was, it was good because yeah. it makes me actually realize that I've, let the general, uh, some of that mountain fitness that I used to get from more days in the mountains, it's like ebbed down a little bit, but like my just finger strength or climbing specific strength from super focused training is, is up. Yeah. And it's, and that keeps me pretty psyched because then I can, when I get those days, like, you know, a day or two a week to go climb, I feel really solid. Yeah. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, and that's enjoyable. Yeah. Me. So you can thrive on those days when yeah. you get that time. Yeah. It's just, uh, and have, have goals. You know, once you've lived in an area long enough, you're, you've climbed a lot of the routes a dozen times. So it's nice to keep pushing the difficulty level. Mm-hmm. Projecting is what you call it and climbing. But yeah. So you guys will go back to Spain this winter? Yeah. I mean, that's like the, pl- I mean, if we get the visa, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're taking that one step at a time. I try not to. FBI. I tried to get my hopes up, you know, <laughs> FBI background check. Not only, it's like they just opened a new visa. So we're like, we're applying for it, but like, you know, who knows? So, but the, the intent is I'd like to keep my expectations low generally for things. So I don't get disappointed if it doesn't work. <laughs> so then I'll be pleasantly surprised if it does. But the plan is to go back in the fall. Sweet. Yeah. So we would move back, um, you know, sometime in October. And then have a, a one year visa is the idea, and rent our our house. So I've got a lot of things to, I got a lot of things <laughs> a to get in logistics. order. Yeah, yeah. So that's like I'll probably do a two week step of just finishing up the, the remodel. You know, just a random little trim pieces and other little light fixtures and stuff that I, yeah. re- I remodel our house. Um, pretty much, yeah. For when my oldest daughter was a year old until the, right until the twins were born. I was like literally carrying a compressor out the, mor- the morning we went to the hospital for the twins. <laughs> right to the... Right to the last second. I mean, it was just... Well, we, I, I remodeled it for a family of two. Yeah. Or a family of four. We didn't intend to have twins. twins. So I literally like, just finished the bedroom. <laughs> and Jimmy calls up. He's like, yeah, we're having... Uh, twins. I was like, ah, shit. <laughs> Cause then I need, we're like, we're, they're sharing they, bedroom. They share a room right now, which is fine. Yeah. yeah. I shared a room with my brother until I was like 11. Or <laughs> but, you know, I had to, uh, you never know. Yeah. So anyway. Well, thanks so much for swinging by. It was awesome to have you in the lab. Yeah. And we had an awesome trip with Mag earlier this year and we did the winter camp and it was like it was a total new experience for me i've i've done a lot of like late season hunts but Mm -hmm. like but like hiking in and building the snow cave and that was just awesome like and your guides were so positive i think like you nailed it earlier in the conversation where like just good dudes to be around was Mm -hmm. so much fun and it was even even for our crew who has kind of traveled the world doing a lot of different hunting, it was a whole new experience and uh, we learned a lot. It was a blast. Nice. Yeah. yeah I'm glad to hear that. Another, that was a, uh, yeah, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't make that one, but that was a, uh, yeah, it's a good crew. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, 
the prerequisite, I would say, for our whole group. Yeah. Is that we'd, we'd all like to, we would enjoy climbing with one another, you know. Yeah. Um, and then like a pretty high passion for the the activity. Mm -hmm. And then like in, enjoying enjoying sharing it with other people, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, generally a pretty fun group. Yeah, you've built something pretty special. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, I, I enjoyed uh, this workout I got to do here. I'll have to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Come back to the lab anytime. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Appreciate it. Dustin. Yeah. yeah bye. Thanks.